Uh, my name is Jim Peterson, and I'm with the Research Division at ARB. And I'm very pleased to be here today with Rob Harley. And um, many of you have worked with him in the past. Um, his research interests are very broad, and uh, it's always a pleasure to work with him because he, he understands um, what's relevant to air quality and to ARB's needs. And he's creative, and at the same time, he's um, very disciplined and gets everything to you on time, and it's always more than you asked for. Um, so um, this, this talk uh, doesn't relate to any of the work that I've done directly. Uh, it's a little close to the things that Nazat Matalabi has been looking at with, uh, with him on uh, climate and the response of of air quality via emissions and meteorology to the climate question. So uh, it's my pleasure to introduce Rob Harley. Um, he'll be taking uh, detailed questions at the end. We have plenty of time for that. If there is um, a point of clarification during the talk, I, I, he's happy to stay on that slide and, and sort things out with people. So uh, we will be taking questions from uh, the net via email. So, uh, welcome. Thank you. It's a pleasure to be here. So, I'll be talking today about the links between air quality and climate change. And maybe as a, uh, a sports analogy to start, you might think about moving the goalposts, that we have some goals where we're trying to get in terms of improving air quality. And uh, climate change may move the goalposts for us and mean we have to do uh, probably more in order to achieve our air quality objectives in the future. So I'd like to start by acknowledging, just in alphabetical order, uh, co-workers at UC Berkeley, two faculty colleagues, Ron Cohen and Alan Goldstein, uh, and then some current and former PhD students, and Allison Steiner, who worked with us. She's now a, a po uh, an assistant professor at the University of Michigan, so she's left Berkeley and, and gone east. Uh, I would also uh, like to thank, I won't name all of the help we've had, but uh, a, a large number of people who've provided technical assistance from the Bay Area Air District, the State Air Board here, Chevron, Lawrence Berkeley Lab, and NOAA. And then the research I'm describing today is work we've already completed, and it's been uh, done under contract for US EPA. So this is not the standard uh, end of CARB project uh, seminar. This is a bonus a seminar you're getting for free. Um, and so I hope you enjoy it. So I thought I'd uh, start with a, uh, an emission inventory slide as, by way of introduction. Uh, these are statewide emission estimates for California. Uh, and these are estimates developed by CARB, published on your website even. So thank you for making that information readily accessible. Uh, and you can see, uh, maybe if we start with VOC uh, emissions, that there's a, a couple of big categories. One is gasoline-related emissions, which are mostly mobile sources. Uh, and I'll try and point here. Uh, there's the gasoline in light blue. And then uh, solvent-related emissions, also a big source. This other uh, uh, stationary sources includes uh, consumer products. It includes uh, gasoline stations, which are s separate from the on-road uh, inventory. And then there's also an, an off-road uh, category for gasoline that's significant. So as we go over to the nitrogen oxides, uh, you see a big piece here from diesel, which is not, not uh, apparent in the, in the VOC inventory, uh, a comparably large uh, contribution from gasoline engines, and then a big piece from off-road diesel as well. So, so the NOx inventory has a lot of mobile source contribution, uh, ships and aircraft, and then relatively small stationary source contribution to NOx, about one-sixth of the total inventory. So some key questions for this seminar are to think about how these emissions might vary on a variety of timescales. We can think about day to day over the course of the summer. We get some hotter days when maybe air pollution is sometimes worse. And one of the, in addition to meteorological differences, uh, there's some, some feedbacks of higher temperatures on emissions. Uh, and so that's a, that's a relevant question both uh, from a day to day variability point of view and if climate changes in a more systematic way in the future, there might also be a feedback to the emission inventory. Uh, 10, 20, 50 years from now. Uh, also, uh, as population changes, as we have continuing rapid growth in a uh, number of people, 
the amount of vehicle travel, uh, and as uh, emission control technologies advance with time, that will also uh, modify uh, the emissions shown uh, here. So you all know that these emissions are uh, relevant not just because of the primary or direct emissions, but because of the secondary pollutants, including ozone and particulate matter, that form as products of these emissions. Okay, so moving on to the next slide. I'm going to start by talking about the VOC, uh, anthropogenic VOC emissions, and how day-to-day -day variations in temperature uh, affect the relative importance of different uh, contributors to these emissions. So here I'm showing the gasoline-related uh, emissions, which were, if you recall, one of the big contributors to, to the VOC inventory, the anthropogenic part anyway. And uh, sort of in, as, a, as a starting point, this splits roughly equally between tailpipe, uh, it's a little more than half, but the tailpipe here, the blue and red color, and a little bit of diesel, are you know, a little more than half of the total. And I was surprised that there's all kinds of, I mean, maybe not surprised, but maybe people wouldn't guess at the, at the very important role of evaporative non-tailpipe sources of VOC emissions, including this very large piece here called running losses, which are evaporative emissions that occur while the vehicle engine is running. Uh, as you know, the vehicles emit a little bit, well, a lot higher rates when the engine and the catalytic converter are cold when you first start uh, the vehicle. So there's some excess emissions in red here associated with the beginning of the trip. And then hot soak is evaporative emissions at the end of the trip. And there's some other categories of uh, evaporative emissions that are relatively small compared to the other things shown here. So I'm going to pose the question, first of all, how these contributions vary from day to day as temperatures go up and down. Uh, but we'll also think about how uh, an implication of this work is how in the future, if climate changes, there might be feedbacks to these emissions that would systematically change the inventory uh, in the future. And especially the evaporative emissions, right, are, uh, for VOC are especially sensitive to temperature. So we would expect maybe, uh, without doing the study, we might expect more evaporative uh, emission contribution on the hotter days. Uh, let's move on. So it's important to think about what the emission mechanism is, tailpipe versus evaporative contribution, uh, because first of all, the, the chemical composition and the reactivity of those emissions differ depending on uh, the mechanism of how they're emitted. Uh, whether and how much they're sensitive to temperature uh, also varies, that the evaporative emissions are much more sensitive than the tailpipe emissions. And finally, what you as a as an agency with responsibility for air pollution control, you would have rather different approaches for control strategies, depending on whether you are trying to reduce tailpipe or evaporative emissions, or, or both. I know is that there's a dual approach, but the relative emphasis uh, is affected by these, the, the split between the tailpipe and the evaporative emissions. So the approach that I'm going to use to try and uh, address this question of how important are the vapor pressure-driven VOC emissions, is to use ambient VOC measurements and reconcile them with uh, source fingerprints for different categories of VOC emissions. This is called chemical mass balance or receptor modeling, for those of you who are familiar with that approach. So let's start with the measurements of VOC concentrations. This is not in a tunnel or in a laboratory. This is in the ambient atmosphere. Uh, my colleague Alan Goldstein and his uh, uh, student Dylan Millay, who graduated, I guess, a couple of years ago now, uh, measured 47 individual VOC in ambient air. Uh, the site where they made these measurements, which was, was Granite Bay, downwind, at least during the summer, downwind of Sacramento, out towards Folsom Lake, uh, for eight weeks during the summer of 2001. So the data are about five years old now. Uh, and I think the most interesting feature of these data compared to, say, the PAMS data that some of you might be familiar with is that these measurements are online and continuous for at 45 minute time resolution uh, for this entire eight week period. So it's not the sort of more traditional collect a canister for a few hours, bring it back to the lab. The, the, the laboratory is out in the field analyzing whole air samples that are collected in situ. Uh, so the, the uh, kinds of VOC that are measured include uh, alkanes and alkenes from propane out to hexane and hexene. And then on a separate channel with a different detector, the aromatics, benzene, toluene, ethyl benzene, and xylenes, uh, some biogenic VOC, and a variety of oxygenated and chlorinated compounds. 
So the Alan Goldstein Research Group has a lot of interest in the biogenic VOC and their oxidation products. Uh, I won't emphasize uh, those results. I'll talk instead about some of the gasoline-related VOC that uh, were included in the measurements. Uh, some of the VOC, th this is not by any means a, a complete list of, of all the several hundred VOC that might be relevant for air pollution. So uh, you might notice, for example, that the C2 compounds, things like ethene and acetylene, uh, are not measured because they weren't trapped in the analytical system used here. Uh, so here's a map for, uh, I, I guess, th this, the, the, the site is close enough to your home base here that you're probably familiar. I have uh, long had the misconception of the Central Valley as primarily agricultural area. And uh, as you all know, it's the increasingly urbanized Central Valley of California. And you can uh, see that uh, by this sort of grayish color as opposed to the green color. Uh, and you can see sort of an urban sprawl surrounding Sacramento. Uh, and so this is not a rural site. This is what I would characterize Granite Bay. It's a, it, the measurements were made on school district property in a suburban area downwind of Sacramento. The flow uh, it, during the summer was pretty reliably, at least during the daytime, uh, from Sacramento out to, towards Granite Bay. So here's the eight-week time series uh, from about mid-July to mid-September. And I'm going to focus specifically on these two, uh, actually, two uh, categories of compounds. One, isopentane as a single molecule, and methylpentanes as the sum of two uh, branch C6 hydrocarbons. And I'll say more about why I've selected these compounds in particular, but uh, one of the reasons is that uh, uh, we can safely conclude that gasoline engines are the overwhelmingly dominant uh, source of these two VOC. But even solvents are not an important contributor to the branched uh, isomers uh, of these alkanes. So we'll be interested in how these uh, VOC vary one relative to the other and in absolute terms. Uh, so a little more on these sort of maybe slightly odd choices of alkanes just to help you understand why uh, we chose them and what we're trying to accomplish here. So the first, uh, first bullet here is about what the oil refiners do to make gasoline. One of their goals, in addition to meeting all the difficult standards that CARB imposes on them, is to meet the octane number rating for gasoline. So to make regular and mid-grade or premium-grade gasoline, you're shooting for numbers around 90, okay, octane number rating. It varies a little bit by grade. And straight-chain alkanes, things like N-pentane, N-hexane, and even worse, N-heptane, have poor octane quality. They have low numbers, right? You see that. Hmm. You don't see that. Uh, in brackets here are the octane number ratings. Remember, we're shooting for a number of around 90. So N-pentane has an octane number of in the low 60s, N-hexane low 30s, and heptane is zero. It actually defines the zero point on the octane number rating scale. So straight chain alkanes, especially the longer ones, are really undesirable to have in gasoline. Actually, so they wouldn't be terribly good tracers to use for gasoline-related emissions because you might have them in solvents and then be a little bit confused about where they were coming from. On the other hand, because the oil companies take this straight chain material and deliberately isomerize it, you notice the, the branched C5 alkane has an octane number rating of 93 now. That's great stuff to put even in premium gasoline. Uh, and the, the methyl pentanes similarly get a, a big boost up compared to this abysmal 31 up into the 70s. So this is a, an isomerization reactor at every refinery in the state or most refineries in the state. Uh, it's done with a catalyst and a hydrogen atmosphere. And a little bit of trivia here is that uh, refiners also put their benzene into this reactor and convert it to cyclohexane. So they, have a, they found a new use for it, which is meeting the carbs benzene limits on gasoline. And that actually uses up some of the hydrogen, whereas uh, th these reactions are hydrogen neutral. Uh, so these uh, compounds turn out to be very abundant in gasoline, which is also helpful for being confident that there's not a lot of other sources out there. Uh, they're not things that you're going to, uh, they're, th they're things you make deliberately in the refinery to put in gasoline. You wouldn't go to this trouble if you were just trying to distill solvent. Uh, and furthermore, as relatively low molecular weight alkanes, they're not reactive. So using something like xylene or an alkene as a tracer is problematic because it reacts so quickly in the atmosphere, you wouldn't be sure how much decomposition had occurred between the point of emission and Granite Bay where we measured uh, these VOC. 
uh, the, the alkanes are sl relatively slow reacting, um, and these two are actually quite similar in their reaction rates as well. Uh, so these are the abundances of isopentane and the methylpentanes in the liquid fuel. And then sort of the key point is there's a molecular weight difference, right? The, the uh, isopentane is a C5. These methylpentanes are C6. So there's a significant difference in the vapor pressures. And so when you go, instead of the liquid fuel and the tailpipe emissions, when you go to the gasoline vapors for, for vapor pressure driven emissions, you see a great enrichment in the isopentane, right? 27% relative to seven and a half. So that's a threefold or more. Whereas the, the methylpentanes in the vapors are not that much different from methylpentanes in the liquid. So it's this, this difference in the relative abundance of the lighter alkanes in vapor type emissions that help us trace. And I, I've been kind of careful about choosing which compounds. There's, you know, there's lots of other light alkanes and butane and pentane, but I'm not so confident with them that gasoline engines are my only source. Whereas here, this, these branched alkanes, it's kind of a clearer story that we know, uh, we know what the big source is. So without going through the math, here are the results showing source contributions by time of day. So if you, th these are now showing not just the methylpentane and the isopentane, but the total VOC measured at Granite Bay. This is the contribution. So the, these uh, source contributions are just VOC concentrations at this receptor. So you see up here that a combined tailpipe and liquid source that has those kind of comparable numbers of both isopentane and methylpentanes in it. And there's some slight differences weekday to weekend uh, because of different traffic patterns. And then down here is the vapors, the vapor pressure driven VOC contribution uh, at the same location in the same times. So you'll see uh, part of what you see here is meteorologically driven uh, issues, that there's differences in wind speed and the mixed layer depth, which causes uh, high absolute source contributions at the not necessarily, at first you say this is the morning and the afternoon rush hour, but it's actually sunrise and sunset. It's kind of related to when people get up and, and go home. But anyway, uh, you're seeing meteorology as well as uh, diurnal patterns and activity reflected in these source contributions. But notice how here uh, source contributions are going down, partly because traffic falls off from the peak, but also because the, the mixing layer rises and you get a lot of... Uh, dilution of whatever's present in the atmosphere. And at that same time, although it's lower, notice these numbers are increasing, that the vapor contribution is going up at the same time as the tailpipe contribution is going down. Uh, I'm going to talk about the, rather than the absolute values that I've shown in the previous plot, I'm going to now talk in relative terms what percent of the total VOC uh, are, are coming from this vapor type contribution. And I'm showing an example now in the middle of the afternoon. We found a correlation in all of the afternoon hours between the percent of the total VOC that's vapor pressure related and ambient temperature. So I'm plotting uh, the, the mean over the whole eight week period was 17%. One sixth of the total vehicle related VOC was vapor pressure driven. The other five sixths were tailpipe and liquid fuel that were not sensitive to the vapor pressure. Okay, so that's, uh, I guess, uh, uh, an important implication for you all thinking about control of VOC emissions is that roughly one six in the summer when it's hot in Sacramento, you know, it's not the Bay Area where we have fog and cool weather. This is hot weather, which is optimized for having a, uh, a high contribution from VO evaporative VOC emissions. So maybe one sixth of the VOC is, is sensitive to vapor pressure uh, and the remaining five six are not are, are going to be tailpipe or liquid fugitive liquid sources of emissions that would require other approaches rather than modifying vapor pressure to, a, to attack. Uh, you do see, though, that that contribution varies. And on the hottest days, which might be the most problematic ones uh, for ozone, uh, that that vapor contribution increases. Uh, and so the range here is from 10 uh, to something like 30 or 40 percent of the VOC. And this doesn't mean that the tailpipe-related emissions go down. It means the total emissions are higher on the hot days. So you need, you need to think about the, uh, uh, the pie growing in size as well as the percentage uh, vapor contribution being larger on the hot days. Okay, so to summarize the uh, findings here, the vapor pressure-driven 
gasoline VOC emissions account for about one-sixth or 17 percent of the total vehicle-related VOC at Granite Bay, downwind of Sacramento. That's, that, that, you know, I, I need to admit that's only one site, but we have a lot of, uh, we have a, 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 a nice record of data at that location uh, and uh, matching data on the fuels from sampled in Sacramento at the same time uh, when the study was done. The contribution of the vapors is maximized during the middle of the afternoon and during the afternoon hours, but not during the morning. Uh, the vapor uh, contribution is correlated with how hot the day is. Uh, so this is one of many uh, parts of the variability we see in the atmosphere in the air quality system, that there's feedbacks of temperature not just to the chemistry but to the emissions. And uh, this is something we should be trying to account for from day to day over the course of the summer and thinking about climate change in the future and this feedback to anthropogenic uh, emissions. Okay, so no clarifying questions so far. I guess that was just beautifully clear and you understood every detail, right? So I'll pause just for a minute. Yes, question at the back. Okay, this graph, chemical mass balance results. Can I re like my voice wasn't big enough there, but they, on the, the plot, chemical mass balance results, it seems like you have a, the afternoon peak around 6 o'clock, and yet what you said on the previous slide was that the, uh, uh, the, the one, the last slide that you showed, that the, the peak was between 2 and 4 as far as the vapor. Could you clarify that a little bit? Sure. More? Absolutely. So what we need to get to that 17% number is to take the, uh, this, these numbers relative to the sum of the two. Okay, so we're talking about the total vehicle-related VOC is the sum. Let's just take the weekday traces. So the red and the green, we add them together, and then we say what percent of the total is this green number. And so the, the vapor contribution actually drops later in the day because the, the traffic, the, the tailpipe-related emissions go up again when there's a lot of late-day traffic. Okay, so that, that's, it's a relative. These, these are absolute numbers, and then the 17% number is a relative percentage of the total. Okay, thank you. Okay, so I'm going to move on to another uh, element of our research on climate change and air quality linkages. And uh, I'm going to turn to air quality modeling. So far, we've been rooted in, uh, in, in data. And uh, now we move into the alternate reality universe of the, of the model system. Uh, and uh, uh, we'll, be we'll be thinking about uh, the future out to even 2050. So some pretty, at some level, some pretty speculative uh, uh, projections for the future uh, air quality conditions. And maybe uh, the flavor that I want to convey here is what are the levers that have a strong effect? And how do, how do one lever compare to another? Uh, not saying, well, I'm going to predict with 99% confidence that the peak ozone is going to be 131 ppb in you know, 2050. That, that's a, um, that would be an absurd kind of prediction to try and make or convince you of. But uh, uh, instead to think about what that, that prediction might be sensitive to and what the most influential factors would be is maybe a more productive discussion for us to have. Uh, so we'll start with a base case, uh, again, Central California. So the, the San Joaquin Valley and the Bay Area, a little bit of Sacramento is just on the edge of the modeling domain that I'll be describing. Uh, we're, we're starting for a, a summer 2000 base case. Uh, some of you in the room are probably familiar with the Central California ozone study, uh, which provided some of the underlying data and analysis that we're uh, describing here. And then we're going to consider perturbations to that base case. Uh, to account for what's the effect if we change temperature on the chemistry. There's different, a lot of the reaction rates in the chemical mechanism are sensitive to temperature, the, so the rates will change. Okay, so that's one of the levers. And then another lever that's also temperature related is when it's hotter, there's not only more evaporation of gasoline, there's more uh, biogenic VOC. Some of it, sort of, the terpenes are a sort of evaporative type emission from uh, plant leaves, isoprene is a little bit different, but both of those biogenic VOC are also quite temperature sensitive. 
Uh, so there's, those are two temperature feedbacks on the emission inventory. Uh, another thing that will change between now and 2050, I can promise you, is population, vehicle travel, and emission control technology. And there's some offsetting effects there, right? There's the counteracting effects of growth and technology change that uh, uh, we need to take the combination of those two factors to arrive at future year emissions. So I've made, um, uh, I've gone beyond uh, the outer, uh, beyond the limits of the MPAC universe and the emission inventory universe uh, as we're currently forecasting in California uh, to make projections out 50 years ahead, which is obviously uh, uh, going to be a somewhat approximate endeavor. Uh, but I'll talk a bit more about the assumptions I've used in trying to forecast that far into the future what anthropogenic emissions might be. Uh, another factor, another lever on the system is that uh, at, on the global scale, there are increasing air pollution emissions, uh, especially in uh, uh, rapidly developing countries in Asia. And those increasing global emissions can affect the inflow of pollutants uh, from the Pacific Ocean into, the, into California. So some changes over a time scale of 50 years that might be significant for air quality locally may be driven by changes that are happening on the global scale as well. Okay, so those are the levers, and I'm uh, going to answer for you, I hope, or at least illustrate some, some, some snapshot of the relative importance of those different levers on the air quality system. Uh, here's a little bit of uh, context for the air quality uh, modeling domain. Uh, you can see uh, the uh, domain stretches from Sacramento down the south end of the San Joaquin Valley from the Pacific Ocean to Lake Tahoe and the uh, Nevada um, uh, on, in color scale here is temperatures. The hottest area is the Central Valley. Uh, it gets cooler up in the mountains and it's cooler along the coastline, nice and cool over the ocean. And then the flow, we have some prevailing northwesterly flow during this time period and then flow uh, in through San Francisco Bay and down the San Joaquin Valley, at least during the daytime that I'm showing is a typical pattern. And there's transport uh, from uh, the Bay Area, for example, uh, into the Central Valley. Uh, among other kind of interbasin transport processes that are occurring here. Uh, here's another sort of context picture on, on VOC emissions. I've got two separate uh, pictures, one of the anthropogenic and a separate slide of the biogenic VOC. Uh, and you'll notice uh, that the magnitudes, the color scales you'll notice are the same for both. It's in moles per second rather than tons per day, but you know we can convert. This is, a, this is proportional to emissions in both, in both cases. Uh, so the color scale is the same, and you, you'll see maybe the first conclusion is the orders of magnitude of the emissions are comparable. Okay? You get, we get peaks, at least, in the same range for both. But the spatial distribution of the emissions is quite different. We have a lot of biogenic VOC in the Sierra Nevada mountains and in less populated areas um, north of... Uh, north of the San Francisco Bay Area and along the coast mountains. So it's sometimes a little bit deceptive when you look at the emission inventory, say for the state as a whole, you say, gee, the biogenic emission inventory, it's huge. Uh, but a lot of that may be in locations where it's not upwind of receptors where we're interested in, say, the ozone air quality problems. So it, uh, it, it, it takes more than just looking at the emission inventory to decide uh, on the importance of, uh, uh, of different categories of uh, emissions. So here are our base case predicted uh, levels of ozone. Uh, this is uh, an average over the, first, uh, the, the third through fifth day of a simulation. The first two days were a Saturday, Sunday, so we're just showing the weekday results here. Uh, we've, moved, we've spun up for long enough that we're not sensitive to the initial conditions in the modeling. So you see three areas of high ozone. One is in the uh, Santa Clara and Livermore Valleys in the Bay Area. Uh, and then in the San Joaquin Valley, in Fresno and Bakersfield are the high predicted ozone areas. You need to kind of ignore the purple colors here, which are sort of at the fringes of the observations. So you can see the, uh, just qualitatively, I guess, we do have in the observations high ozone downwind of the Bay Area, Fresno, and uh, Bakersfield area. And there's some high ozone in Sacramento that the model's not reproducing yet. Uh, here's a little bit uh, sort of more advanced topic in atmospheric chemistry, which is to think about what happens in terms of chain termination 
And this, this maybe comes back to the different regimes of VOC versus NOx limited chemistry for ozone formation. And so one of the ways of diagnosing that is saying when we have radicals in the atmosphere, where do they go when they die? So there's two pathways. One is that uh, on the right-hand side, okay, chain termination rates. Uh, on the right-hand side, maybe the one you're more familiar with, the hydroxyl radical can react with NO2 to form nitric acid. So this is the rate at which that reaction is happening. And you can see a lot of termination via this pathway in NOx-rich environments, okay, downwind of the Bay Area, you see some highway emissions and some other kind of urban centers where there's a lot of NOx present. So where NOx is present, it wins in, the, in, the, in, in creating sinks for, for OH and HO2 radicals. When you get up into the Sierra Nevadas where NOx is scarce, uh, instead you get high levels of HO2 and peroxyalkyl radicals that react together to form organic peroxides. So you see a different spatial pattern here of uh, in the more remote areas, you have a lot of peroxide. In the more polluted areas, you have a lot of nitric acid being formed. And this is suggestive of different chemical regimes within this uh, Central Valley modeling domain. Okay, so enough of the base case. Let's start thinking about the future now. So we're going to uh, consider a, a scenario of CO2 doubling relative to pre-industrial times. So CO2 is already something like 380 ppm. So we've, uh, we've already come part of the way towards that doubling. And uh, let's say for discussion that might happen around 2050. It's not clear exactly when it will double. I haven't increased anything else, any of the other greenhouse gases, though. So you say, wait a minute, you know, I, think, I, I don't think CO2 is going to double until 2100. Harley's being, you know, too pessimistic. We've passed, you know, good new initiatives for greenhouse gas controls in California. We're going to slow the rate of CO2 uh, and so, uh, you know, I would admit that, that 2050 may be on the pessimism, not necessarily, uh, it, it could be even sooner, but it could be, you know, there, there's a range of years when, when we'll arrive at this two-time pre-industrial CO2. But uh, because I haven't changed other greenhouse gases, this is not a particularly pessimistic scenario for the future. Uh, so we've relied on work done by a group at UC Santa Cruz. Lisa Sloan was the PI. The paper is Snyder et al. It was published in GRL, Geophysical Research Letters, about five years ago. And that group, working with researchers at Lawrence Livermore Lab, uh, used a, the community climate model, which is an NCAR a global model, to then in turn drive a regional climate model for California at 40 kilometer resolution to predict things like temperature, rainfall, um, climate related or climate relevant uh, variables um, with much better spa spatial resolution than you get in a typical global model. Okay, so we want to look, because California is so heterogeneous, going from coast and urban to agricultural to mountain, we want to capture the, the spatial differences in what's going on with climate change over this very heterogeneous uh, domain. So here, just as an example, you can see the changes in temperature forecast. This is the output of the regional, of Snyder et al.'s regional climate model. Uh, you can see much larger changes in temperature forecast in the Sierra Nevadas. This is for August, the month of our uh, base case simulation, uh, on the or approaching four, three and a half degrees, let's say, versus more like one and a half degrees on the coast. So uh, more than a, so, so not just a, a common delta T throughout the domain. We have bigger perturbations to temperature as we move inland. And so then uh, here's one of the, I talked about the levers, so this delta T superimposed on the base case is a lever that changes ozone. And so what's shown here is now the difference in ozone. And notice they're uh, all positive. Okay, so ozone goes up throughout the domain. Just looking to see if there's any zeros. Well, there, there's some numbers where the changes aren't very large. But all of this green, yellow, orange color are increases on the order of 1 to 5 ppb ozone because of this 1 to 4 degree temperature increase. Okay, and this, this uh, particular change here is just because the temperatures affect the reaction rates in the chemistry. No other changes, just that one feedback of temperature on chemistry. Eileen.
Uh, is the change in temperature that you show the average daily temperature or the peak temperature? And also, you're showing higher increases in the mountains than you are in the Central Valley, which I think is sort of interesting. Yeah, so this, this is the, it's the, the delta in temperature. It's not, this is, the, so the, the temperature change, the, the largest temperature changes are not necessarily with where it's already hottest, uh, is what this is uh, suggesting. Uh, I believe these are uh, daily average or even monthly average delta teams. Okay, well, let's look at some of the other uh, levers. I said another effect of temperature was to uh, lead to increased biogenic VOC emissions, and that in turn also affects ozone. So this is a second temperature lever on the system. Uh, here are the percent increases in biogenic VOC in response to that same delta T we were just talking about and looking at on the previous slide. And so you see in the Sierra Nevadas, we have changes in, on the order of plus 40% to biogenic VOC emissions. Uh, and in relative terms, the percent changes are smaller, but still significant on the order of, let's say, 20% throughout much of the, uh, uh, the inhabited parts of uh, California at lower elevations. Uh, but where the biogenic emissions change a lot is not necessarily where the ozone is most sensitive to those emissions. Remember in the slide where we talked about chain termination, we had a lot of peroxide being formed in the Sierras and it's, it's where the, it's in the nitric acid forming regime in the NOx uh, sensitive, how do I put this, in the, in the NOx saturated regime where things are VOC sensitive, where you see the biggest effect. So in the Bay Area, which is uh, probably more VOC sensitive than other parts of uh, the central California domain, uh, is where the change in the biogenic emissions, even though it's not the largest change, it's the most influential change because the system is very sensitive to VOC addition in those locations. Okay, so again, it's details that just going from the emission inventory, you wouldn't be able to put together the combination of the sensitivity of the ozone system to precursors combined with uh, the changes in emissions. And you need the, you need the atmospheric model to synthesize uh, those, those uh, issues. No, this is a separate perturbation that just has a different biology. So that these are you know, two separate calculations. And you know, we can have a discussion about whether they're linearly additive. But, but the, these are not, uh, uh, you're, not seeing, you're not also seeing the effect of temperature on chemistry. You're just seeing a biogenic emission perturbation here. And it's, again, uh, a peak of about 5 ppb change in ozone. So you put that together, and you have a 2 to 10 ppb instead of a 1 to 5 PVB change for each of the individual. Actually, that's, uh, that's somewhere where you do have to be careful adding because the, the, the five PVBs were in different locations, and so you wouldn't necessarily get the 10 by, because the, fives are, the five PVBs are in two different places. Okay, so I said anthropogenic emissions out to 2050. Uh, We've taken the California Department of Finance population forecasts, which do go out that far and resolve down to the county level. So rather than assuming a uniform growth factor over the entire domain, we've got county-specific population growth. We've assumed vehicle travel growing at the same rate as population. Uh, and we've got diesel truck travel growing faster than population, which has been the, the, the past trend, uh, which we, we assume will continue in the future. The result is that the growth uh, pressures are larger in the Central Valley than they are along the coast, although growth is exerting upward pressure everywhere. Uh, you'll, you'll notice there's sort of a dividing line in this color scale that separates coastal counties from inland counties, and that's really because of more rapid population growth. So these, uh, the results here have gone a step further, which is to say how do, how do the emissions change? So we also factor in technology change as well as growth here. So let me summarize what's shown here, and then I'll step back and explain a little more. But so what we're forecasting is on the order of 50% reductions in anthropogenic VOC and CO relative to present day, relative to 2000 base case, not to relative to pre-control. Present day emissions are already controlled to a significant degree, and we're assuming a you know, further degree of control that will result in, after growth, a, a reduction by a factor of about two, with larger reductions in the emissions in the coastal areas, okay, where there's not as much growth. The technology change is projected to be similar throughout. Then for NOx, uh, 
because the diesel truck traffic is growing faster, the growth pressure, which and di the diesels are the big source of NOx that remains in the inventory now, uh, the, the progress in controlling NOx we forecast to be not as great as VOC on carbon monoxide. That's certainly been the experience to date. Okay, we've made more progress controlling VOC and CO than we have for NOx. And so we forecast that that, uh, that past experience will continue, that we're always a little bit further ahead with VOC and CO control than we are with NOx, uh, even as far as 2050. Uh, although with some of the big diesel control efforts coming, we may catch up a little bit on the, on the NOx side uh, in the degree of control we achieve. Uh, so the other uh, sort of assumption really that I need to tell you is that we've assumed that the technology part of this calculation, so we've got the population growth putting upward pressure, and we've got another factor to reflect the uh, improved control effectiveness, and we're assuming 80% reduction further beyond current level of control. Okay, so let's say we're, for argument's sake, we're at 90% level of control for VOC. With another 80% control on top of the existing 90, that takes us to 98% control. Uh, for NOx, maybe we're at 40% control and we get to 90. Okay, so our starting, not only our, um, our growth, but our starting point in terms of what level of control we've already achieved is different on these pollutants. Anyway, I've tried to factor in both the present day circumstances and different assumptions about rate of progress and rate of growth for these different pollutants. So we're not scaling all pollutants the same. We're not scaling all grid cells the same. We've got both spatial and pollutant specific uh, information included in the scenario. But I, I have to say it's still, it's still just a scenario and reasonable people could uh, say, well, we, we have uh, you know, other assumptions about either more optimistic or more pessimistic about both growth and technology change over this time period. Okay, so the uh, slide on the uh, left here is the good news. Uh, there's one lever that exerts significant downward uh, significant downward uh, pressure on ozone. So all of these emission control efforts uh, lead to significant decreases in ozone throughout the domain, uh, and some of them as large as 20 ppd ozone. Um, note, however, that because we're controlling both VOC and NOx simultaneously, that that dual precursor control strategy uh, gives possibly lower uh, reductions, lower peak reductions in ozone than, than focusing on one or the other. However, because you're trying to control ozone over a broad region that includes both VOC and NOx sensitive uh, regimes, I, I don't know that there's an alternative. It's just that in the Bay Area, say, emission reductions focused on VOC alone might have given larger uh, ozone reductions than the dual precursor strategy. So you know, initially, maybe a reaction is, gee, is it only 20 PVE? With 50 years and all those 80% technology factors, and, and you know, my, my reply would be, well, there's growth, offsetting growth, which takes away some of the benefit. And then there's a dual precursor control strategy, which in at least some parts uh, of the domain gives offsetting effects on air quality. Uh, there's other pollutants like nitrate that might also um, factor into the decisions about which pollutants or, or the dual precursor uh, control. So then finally, the, the last uh, uh, panel on this slide shows the change in ozone because of changes in the Pacific Ocean inflow, the boundary conditions for pollutants coming off the ocean because of factors beyond California's control uh, operating at the global scale in terms of atmospheric change. And so you can see the changes we've assumed from base case for carbon monoxide, methane, and ozone at the inflow. Uh, we didn't change NOx at the inflow because we already had a couple of PPV, rather high levels of NOx relative to, to marine background. Uh, so there you see increases, and uh, the increases are largest right along the Pacific Ocean boundary, where that, in, where that inflow boundary condition is effect is most strongly felt. So, uh, Bruce, you asked a question earlier about starting to add together these d different individual levers. So now I've combined for you the biogenic VOC emissions and the temperature effects on chemistry to give this panel on the left here. Uh, we actually do get pretty close to 10 dBV peak changes in ozone when you combine those two effects of temperature and the chemistry uh, with smaller changes elsewhere in the domain. And then when you put everything together, the uh, temperature effects shown here, the future emissions, 
and the changes in the Pacific Ocean inflow, you see a really mixed picture. Some locations, especially in coastal areas, increasing in their ozone levels, whereas the inland area is showing decreases. Okay, so this, if you like, is the bottom line uh, of the story I've told of these four different levers, them operating all together, and the net effect, okay, which is uh, overall probably good news for uh, the most, the highest ozone areas, uh, Fresno and Bakersfield, uh, but perhaps uh, some concerns in uh, some of our more coastal areas where uh, maybe the way to say it is uh, there's relatively, what, what the air quality is better at a starting point, but the, the degree of improvement is uh, um, really offset by some of the other changes occurring. So I've spoken about four levers, and there's a lot of other important levers that I haven't spoken about. So here is my uh, uh, list of disclaimers, and there's probably more. Uh, the effects on water resources, I mean, California has this Mediterranean climate where we don't really have much rainfall to speak of in the summer. But uh, winter season effects can persist into the summer season, both in terms of water for drinking and agriculture and in terms of drought in, uh, in natural ecosystems. Uh, changes in, there's an interaction between changes in the hydrologic cycle and changes in temperature. That means that snowpack is forecast to persist not nearly as long into the, into the spring season as before. So the, the timing of runoff and the amount of uh, snow evaporating versus water running off uh, are all affected by these changes. Uh, an important effect of drought is uh, influence on ecosystem change and forest fires are one of the important agents of ecosystem change. Uh, and that also brings me to questions of uh, particulate matter, which obviously forest fires are an important source of, but also I haven't uh, considered uh, effects of climate change on particulate matter air quality, which is another important dimension of this discussion. Uh, ecosystem and land use change and the direct effect health effects of really hot water, uh, as we've seen in recent years in, in Europe, for example, uh, the, the older people can have really real difficulty tolerating hot weather, especially if they don't have uh, air conditioning and other, other amenities to make them help them get through it. Uh, and I also haven't considered the effects of uh, changes in the frequency of high ozone events or in the length of the high ozone season. So I, I have this picture as a summary slide. And I show for you individually these left four for three specific uh, subregions of the overall domain, Fresno and Sacramento in the Central Valley in the red and orange colors, and then the Bay Area in blue. And you can see the uh, sign of the effects looks pretty similar across the board in all of these locations, but the magnitudes are different. I've done it in percent because the absolute PPB levels are different. So I'm comparing now changes relative to the base case existing ozone in these areas. Uh, so you can see the temperature and uh, temperature on chemistry and temperature on biogenic VOC are both sort of two to five percent effects on ozone plus the 2050 emissions uh, scenario is eight to 15 percent minus. And then the changes in the inflow boundary condition are comparable to the temperature effects, another two to five percent plus. And when you combine the temperature effects, roughly linear, adding those two temperatures together. Uh, and then when you put everything together, you really see them moving the goalposts. The climate change is going to offset some of the benefits that we would otherwise accrue from the air pollution control programs in California. That's moving the goalposts. That means we'll need to do more than we were previously planning to do in order to attain air quality standards in 2050. So I think you know, the, the problem is already challenging. And I'm sorry to tell you that this is just going to add to the challenges. Uh, so uh, we have both from an assessment point of view and a control point of view, even more on our plate now than, uh, than we did in the past. Uh, I don't know if that's good or bad news, but I've tried to give you a, a frank assessment of the issues, and I hope it's been uh, illuminating. Uh, I've left with Jim Peterson a couple of copies of reprints of these last two papers, Steiner and Rubin, which describe the uh, research I've uh, published today. I also include the uh, climate modeling work from the Santa Cruz and Livermore group. Uh, I don't have reprints of that, but if, you, if you're interested in seeing more of the details of the driving uh, climate calculations, those are available as well. So I'd be happy to have further discussion, and thank you all for coming and uh, for your interest.
Thank you for your presentation, Dr. Harley. I have a question for your 2050 simulations. Um, when you took into account growth, um, did you change the spatial allocation of the, the VOC emissions or, or take into account changes in where the biogenic emissions would come from? So the, the, what we did was to take, we went down to the county level and scaled existing emissions in each county by the, the county-specific growth factor. So that means if there were sort of tracts of farmland that got developed into a suburban tract home or something, that we didn't move the emissions into those newly developed land parcels. We just scaled up the emissions within each county where they already were. Uh, so a more detailed calculation would uh, figure out via satellite or land use planning information you know, where the new population had been added. Some of that will happen in the existing kind of developed areas, but some of it is at the fringes or in currently undeveloped areas. But we did go down to county levels, so hopefully we've at least captured some of the spatial detail. But I agree with your, I think your, the intent of your question, which is to say it would be possible to kind of go a level further in the detail of where the changes in emissions were occurring. In your analysis, uh, looking at gasoline property change over the year, uh, was that captured in your emissions level, or, or you haven't done that? Uh, you, you haven't included the effect of gasoline property change over the year. Let's see. So our base case is 2,000. So we would already have phase two reformulated gasoline. Correct. But the switch to ethanol. Let's see. I think we, I think we did not include the change in VOC speciation because of the phase out of MTBE. We just took our base case in 2000 and perturbed mass, but not speciation. And maybe a, another point is, you know, the first part of my talk, I was discussing the day-to-day -day variability in vapor type VOC emissions from anthropogenic sources. And then I had my four levers. Well, that's lever number five, and it wasn't one of the levers that we considered uh, on the on the uh, ozone system. It, um, it turns out that it's the biogenic VOC, or the, the, the tonnage in question is larger and the reactivity is higher. So I think that's a more important lever. But uh, I don't want to say the, uh, that anthropogenic VOC lever is, un, uh, the, the, the gasoline vapors is unimportant. It's just not one, not, not one we assessed in the modeling. But I think we at least have the, the um, the information now to make an assessment of that lever, and that, that could be a, a next step. Qualitatively, can you give us a description how that's going to affect the result? Uh, it would be similar uh, directionally to the temperature effects on uh, biogenic VOC. Uh, it would be more focused in the urban areas where those emissions are concentrated and it would lead to increases in ozone, especially in the Bay Area. Hi, Rob. Excellent presentation. Um, I had a question on your VOC data analysis. This, this uh, factor of um, EVAP versus tailpipe of 17%. How well does that match the emission inventory? Because it seemed like the ratio was different. And my second question would be, you know, during a hot summer day, everyone in, in Sacramento uses their air conditioner. And how would that complicate the interpretation of, of the data? Because in, if it had a differential effect on tailpipe versus evaporative emissions. Okay. Good question. So uh, to come to the first question, which was, uh, you know, Harley claims 17%. And what does the emission inventory say? So this pie chart kind of gets at that question. You need to sum up uh, the evaporative pieces here, the resting, running, hot soak, and diurnal. But then you need to think about this running loss piece especially and say, are all of those VOC emissions vapor type or are there liquid leaks of fuel from the pump seals leaking that aren't vapor pressure related? So that's a, a little bit of a moving target. The auto industry feels that more and more of the running loss emissions that remain are of the vapor type now. But some of the older vehicles with leaks in the fuel system would have a, a non-vapor 
So it, it's actually, it, it depends, I guess, on the assumption you make about how much of this running loss is liquid versus vapor type emission. The diurnal is, that's all vapor. Hot soak, well, so the, these others are small, so let's not worry, but you know, really the main issue is here, what to assume about running loss. Um, if, we, if we took a 50-50 split uh, of running losses, we came out with sort of roughly comparable estimates in the inventory and, uh, and in the and of one-sixth. However, if you take all of this running loss as vapor type emissions, then the inventory has much more vapor in it than the atmosphere. So that, that's the, um, I, I hesitated, but I'm glad you put me on the spot to make that comparison. I hesitated to make it because of being, oh, sorry, I'm not supposed to point at the screen, because of not being uh, sure how much of the running loss is really the vapor type emission. Um, this is something that the fuels group and I have been discussing and uh, you know, the, the, I don't want to put words in their mouth, but the, the discussion has been pushing us in a direction towards more and more of this being vapor type over time. So uh, that would say potentially that the, the inventory might have too much vapor relative to this one site, Granite Bay. I, I would say this would be an analysis that would be interesting to, to extend to a couple of sites and to repeat now with ethanol, uh, ethanol blended gasoline. Now your second question, uh, please remind me. On um, EVAP versus tailpipe emissions and if that complicates the interpretation of the data at higher temperatures. So there's been a, a, a study of air conditioner effects. Uh, I think Harold Haskey was the lead author. Uh, and the main findings of that were that fuel consumption CO and NOx emissions go up with air conditioner use, but the tailpipe hydrocarbons did not. And so the engine load effects on exhaust hydrocarbon emissions are a little bit counterintuitive sometimes. Anyway, uh, for the VOC apportionment that I've described here, I, I don't think that would be a big factor. But for, you're right though that for you, you do burn more fuel and you do have more CO and NOx when the air conditioner is running. Uh, but for this VOC source apportionment, I think it's not a it's not a major concern. Hi Rob, you mentioned uh, that there was some greater reductions in VOCs than in NOx in 2050, but admitted that because of some of the heavy duty diesel rigs that are coming on board, we might get significant NOx reductions. And I've heard it's getting harder and harder to find VOCs to reduce. Do you think it's worth investigating what if you get very different percent reductions in VOC and NOx? Yeah, so I'm, I'm actually assuming 80%, I'm assuming a similar level of progress relative from the current starting point. We're gonna get 80% further relative to our, our our current level of control. Um, another factor that's in there is I've got the, the diesel related traffic growing faster than the population in the gasoline. So that's not a technology factor, it's a, it's a you know, more, import, more imports of goods from Asia into our ports and then shipping stuff by, by truck around the state and more goods moving by truck. Uh, so, th so I take your point that uh, you know, we, we may actually catch up a little bit on the NOx front. You know, VOC, VOC control has raced ahead and NOx control, we kind of had some uh, things that didn't work out as well as we'd hoped, I guess would be the way to put it diplomatically. And uh, so we're trying to catch up now on NOx control, which really lagged seriously for the, you know, through the 1990s. We had a decade of just big setback on NOx control. And that, we're, we're feeling that now. There's a big, there's a big amount of lost time um, because of what happened with the diesel NOx. Um, anyway, I don't want to go into all the details, but who knows who listening on the web. Um, so are there email questions that we should be? Okay. Um, are there other parameters other than the uh, temperature that could affect uh, reaction rates that you have not considered? You know, I didn't talk about it. We did also look at changes in water vapor concentration as another lever. Uh, and that, for example, when you have ozone photolyzing, the, one of the excited states of the oxygen atom can react with water vapor to form hydroxyl radicals. There's an important initiation step in the atmospheric chemistry that's sensitive to the, not to rainfall I'm talking about now, I'm talking about the water vapor during the summer 
you know, at the time that you're worried about ozone. It's actually one of the main differences in atmospheric chemistry between the western and eastern U.S. is the humidity is much lower in California. So we get much less Hox production for a given level of ozone here because of the drier climate. Uh, so we did increase uh, water vapor. It was a small effect compared to the temperature changes that I showed, but it was also uh, if you, if you uh, accept my presumption that water vapor levels will increase, uh, it would also exert an upward pressure on, on ozone levels because of increased Hox production in that. Is that. That's the main reason. There are, uh, there are other, uh, especially in the, in the particulate matter side, lots of sensitivities to humidity and water vapor as well. Thank you, Professor Ali. Um, I think many people, and this is something that's happened more and more, <coughs> have presumed that because you increase the temperature, biogenic emissions will naturally and significantly increase. I think experience that Lodgett Forest and then the most recent analysis that's been done for um, um, home oak in Spain demonstrates that, although that is true within one season, that as temperature increases, your biogenic emissions here, isoprene, methylbutenol, and monoterpenes increase. However, if you change the vedo zone, so uh, relative humidity, um, by 10 to 15 percent, you basically reach a station of stomatal closure, and your biogenic emissions significantly decline, basically suggesting that, for example, though this is only a suggestion, that among the things that you said you hadn't covered is the expansion of what we call in California the semi-permanent drought to many, many more months of the year because of the early, uh, earlier and earlier snow, snow melts may actually decline, lead to a decline in biogenic emissions in general. That, that's one thing that I think I just want to make as a, as a comment. And the second comment that I'd like to make is that a key, key issue in this, in this process is the land use changes. Now, I don't like to do land use changes because it's really, 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 really complicated and makes life very, very difficult. But I believe, and you, you may correct me if I'm wrong, that California Energy, Energy Commission has conducted some significant work in the land use projections for 2020 and 2050, which would be extremely exciting to see what you would do with it. Okay, thank you for those comments. I, I certainly agree with your point about uh, the complexities of feedbacks on biogenic emissions, that it's not just temperature, the, the water availability, uh, you know, sort of a seasonal a carryover from the winter, and then even sort of drying throughout the course of the summer. Uh, those are important factors to consider as well. And, and we have not, we've looked at a, just a direct, you know, we've got the standard environmental correction factors for biogenic emissions, which look at light, and, and actually we didn't assume any change in cloudiness, so the light didn't change, but the temperature effects are just moving up and down those standard uh, uh, terpene and isoprene adjustments. Uh, and as you point out, there could be more to it than that. Pleasure. Thank you.